and welcome to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I will be your host for this morning or this afternoon or this evening or at night time or depending whenever you're going to be listening because after all it is your podcast. Um, now we have we have creators, we have designers, we've had conference people on, we have had distributors, we have had logistics people on and behind every great thought there is obviously has to be a really good brain. So we only not went for a good brain, we went for a giant one. So joining me from the giant brain is Ian McAllister. Yay! Hello Ian. Good evening. Good evening or morning or afternoon. <laughs> well, whenever you happen to be listening. Um, thanks for coming on. <coughs> Thank you for having me on. I'm a nice, to t- nice to speak to you finally. I know. I'm a fan of, I'm a kind of a fan of your work. So oh, thank you. When you said uh, you would want to come on, I was like, "Yes, this is good." Um, so it's all good. It's all good. The reason that we do this is because there are quite simply not enough podcasts about board games. There's us. There's the unlucky frog. There's the uh, the first player marker or token. I can't remember. It's so, it's so terrible. I need to write that down. Yeah, pretend- I'm, I'm, I don't know about those guys either. Yeah, uh, no. I need to. Track them down. <laughs> Track them down and find out about them. There potentially might be another one, Ooh. but we might talk about that as Indeed. things progress. Um, the second reason that we do this is because me and Ian, Ian have been talking on and off, back and forward. Um, he's part of the little kind of Scottish community that we all float about in terms of tabletop. Um, and it was time he actually came on the show and had a chat with us. So here we go. Um, so you well this evening, first of all, you good? Yeah, not bad at all. Yeah, pretty well. Good stuff. Good stuff. <coughs> but the thing we need to find out, and everybody will be itching for, is to find out a little bit about your history sure. with the hobby. So we're going to have a little look back at the ears of the past. We're going to have a little look in the nose of the present before <laughs> before we stare off into the eyes of the future. And all in the middle is a beautiful giant brain. So do you, want to, do you want to tell us a little bit? I'm going to keep saying that. For a while I was going to just call you, It's <laughs> welcome to the show, it's Ian McAllister from Giant Brian. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> just you know see, either, either way, it doesn't really matter. Just see, how, just see how long we could keep it going until you actually just turned around and said, it's brain, there's a picture yeah. of a brain on the logo, it's not a Brian, <laughs> it's a brain. Um, but anyway, do you want to tell us how you got into the hobby? Yeah, sure. So I think, like, getting into the hobby properly, my parents are always, like, quite... Uh, like, we. I always used to play some some board games, that kind of thing, more traditional games for my parents. Uh, but my dad had a pen pal in Ravensburger um, right. of, like, Ravensburger games. You'll see their sort of little blue triangle in a yeah, lot of games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I started to... When we would go over there um, to visit... Uh, I would pick up uh, games like sort of Sagaland, which I think was called Enchanted Forest over here. Um, yeah. Like Gold Grabber, things like that. So like getting a bit of exposure to that, um, that sort of more German sensibility of game design quite early on. Um, and I, was, I sort of became sort of really intrigued by board games then. And I would, pl- I would play sort of board games all the time. And I had some very early design efforts as well that were, Terrible. We'll not talk about it. <laughs> no, we have to talk about it now. Uh, I think I think I su- I think I submitted a game about fishing to um, was it MB Games at the time? Milton Bradley. Like, M- Milton Bradley. When they, they are they still that? I don't actually know. I think they are. Yeah, I think uh, so. I think they are, but yeah, I, I, I don't really pay attention to that that sort of side of the gaming hobby anymore. But I think Milton Bradley said this, so I think I submitted a game at one point. Got a very nice letter back saying no, thank you, but <laughs> still got still got a letter back. Um, and uh, I think my sort of I, I over the course of my sort of school period and, and into academy, um, I picked up a little bit of role playing stuff, so like fighting fantasy books and that kind of thing. Yeah, Steve Jackson, Ian Lewis, and stuff. I got uh, I always had a, a lot of those, and then I picked up the advanced fighting fantasy stuff, which was essentially the role playing game. Um, yeah, I never so got I, I never I, got into that. I, I was I mean I am child of the 70s 80s so mm. i remember warlock of fire top mountain coming out and i yeah. remember a friend saying you gotta read this and it's like well how do you read it and you open the book and it just you know you flick through as a book is normal and you go there was not got numbers on it and 
there's kind of it's got pictures in it, Dave. It's like it's not a kids' book, and he went, no, 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 read it, read it, read it. And I remember reading that, and then it just kind of like blew my mind. Yeah, at absolutely. The time. Did you collect them all? Did you have like the full set, or when did no, you? I, when... I, no, I, no, nothing that major. Um, I, I had a few of them, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't have like all of them by any means. Uh, have you have you ever followed? Uh, if do you follow um, Ian Limson on uh, on Twitter at all? Because he's shown off like some of the maps, like the sort of like the, the logic paths through those books, and some of the new ones, and he's shown that off on Twitter, and it's just it's a spider's web. <laughs> it's an amazing thing to watch. You know, I've seen, how I've, they how they design it. I've 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 looked through. I mean, I remember um, kind of looking through the kind of the Grail Quest stuff as well. So all those types of books kind of fascinated me, and I think it head, it it ended up with me heading down the kind of the rabbit hole. So I'm always fascinated. How do you do? You write a story. Yeah, absolutely. Do you write three separate stories and then do you just split it up, or do you write seven different stories? Because I remember um, at primary school, and this is how old I am, the. Um, what was it? The Crown of Kings came out, and it was at the time. I think it was three books. I think it was the, or maybe even been four. There was, a, I think there was the Sham 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 U, the Sham Utanti Hills. There was like Care City Port of Traps. There was like, a, and then there was like the actual Crown of Kings book. I think there was probably a third one as well. All right. But one of our teachers decided to sit us down as a class exercise, and I think he thought it'd be cool as a gimmick to sit and read this book and then get everybody kind of um, splitting into groups and making yeah. decisions. And, of course, that was the big mistake. He actually ended up kind of saying, right, which one are you picking? And people said, oh, we want to do this. And then, okay, so what do you want to do? Oh, we want to do this. So he kept them separate. And then as time went on, I came, I mean, within about, like, say, half an hour, everything was splintered. <laughs> it was an absolute I can imagine, mess. Yeah. And he actually needed to, he actually needed to kind of... To kind of stop. So you went, <laughs> but you went from that into the advanced. Yeah, like, I, I think only ran it a couple of times, but the advanced fighting science stuff was basically their 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 sort of take on a GM role playing game like D anD D or something like that. It was actually like it was actually sort of a little bit of a precursor to like some of the mechanics in it had a precursor to what you see in a lot of the indie role playing game scenes with where they talked about the story being like a film and having very defined scenes and acts and things like that. And that's something that a lot of the indie role-playing games later on yeah. um, took up as well. So it, it was sort of a precursor to those kind of things. I think I only ran it a couple of times for some friends I'd press-ganged into doing so. Uh, I've still got them somewhere. I think they're, they're, on, they're on a shelf behind me right now. Really? Uh, and I think they, they got re-released a few years ago through someone. Though I didn't quite like the the format of those books, the, like the the original ones were just the same size as the Fine Fantasy books, the sort of yeah, little, yeah. just little little novels, but quite thick. So yeah, there's there's like Dungeoneer and Alantia, Alantia Black Sand and Dungeoneer. And Dungeoneer Pike... is Dungeoneer got the one where it's got the green monster on the front. Yeah, it does indeed. Because yeah. I had I I had that one, <clears throat> and it was the one about was it. Not in Dungeon you could run a campaign about somebody being a werewolf or something like that or going through. I remember Possibly, like, yeah. I remember trying oh that was like, like this is my childhood. I feel like I'm on some kind of psychological counselling and I'm talking back about my adventures and role playing but Or like this is your life. Richard, these are your no. games your childhood. Because <laughs> no, I'll just because, you know, I'll feel really, really old, but <laughs> Yeah, they were really um that was kinda like the precursor to kind of that. Did I mean did that kind of take you into the role playing stuff I mean did you go kind of like full D&D &D after that or did you did you stay along with the kind of the board games or did other activities kind of get in the way and kind of draw you away from the hobby yeah like from like during like from the I, I, I did sort of dungeoneer and that kind of thing towards the end of primary school and then yeah. like throughout my academy uh, period in academy which would be about six years um, from like sort of what like 12 to 18 I didn't really participate in the hobby that much at all like yeah. i still had board games at home and that kind of thing um and, and like some of the, like the Ravensburger games like we we're talking about earlier but yeah i didn't really get into D, D and stuff like that at all until i came to university um and when i got to university i met my well my now brother-in-law david um really oh my yeah God. okay <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to that <laughs> i think i think we have to 
absolutely. Uh, <laughs> like, so yeah, I, I, met, I met my I met my, my, my friend David then and another and another David. Yeah, there's da- David's everywhere because it's Scotland. Yes. Um, <laughs> Can't move and uh, we play. Uh, I picked up like Settlers of Catan, and we like came across Blackline Games in Edinburgh. Yeah. Which is then in the basement of Flip, which is now like a a, a Tesco on South Car Street, which was like a weird sort of fashion place. But they hired, they rented space downstairs, and um, Liam Liam McConnell, who runs Blackline Games, was just starting up down there. Yeah. So he had things like sort of car wars and a couple of bits and pieces and that kind of thing, but very very small. Um. So we came, we came across him, and I picked up Catan, and we played a lot of Settlers of Catan. I, I, I just finally sold off my old bean off, bean up copy recently. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. It just wasn't getting to my table anymore. So, I sort what's of the, what's the attraction with it? Because I must admit, um, I, I kind of don't get it. <laughs> I don't know why, and I don't know if it's because it's the luck. The luck thing always has always um, kind of got to me a bit. And I guess yeah. that's because I've never played it enough to kind of fully strategize it. But what, why, why did you get it so much to the table? What's the beauty of Catan for you? I, th- I think at the time it was something so different to what I'd played before, to 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 the sort of like really sort of simple family games like Sagaland and Gold Grabber and other things that I had as a kid. Yeah, it was very very different. It had a sort of negotiation element. Uh-huh. It had it had a modular board that was different every time. Um, I mean, yeah, you're you're right. Your criticisms of Catan are totally valid. There is a, a heavy random element um, there, um, and people can shut you down and shut you out. But yeah, I uh, I knew people who are more obsessed with it than me. But we, we, it was very simple to get to the table as well. It's easy to play, so you could play it in a very short period of time while having a couple of beers. So yeah, it was it, it was a good laugh. And at the and. Um, Ben was quite uh, enthusiastic about Vampire: The Eternal Struggle, the vampire. Yeah, card game. yeah, yeah. So I start, I, I like sort of the hobby doors were opened to me then. Basically, that's where I sort of started to get into like the hobby side of the gaming, I suppose if you want to call it that. So like collectible card games, like uh, Vampire and Seventh uh, Sea, and the original, the original Doomtown as well. Oh right, uh, okay, yeah. Because Doomtown is Doomtown not kind of finished up. No, it's Doom still Town keep, about. Doom Town, Doom Town keeps having people coming in, running in with uh, like paddles and like resurrecting it. Yeah, it's really weird. So there was Doom Town Reloaded, mm-hmm. which was which came around, and that's a really nice uh, reimagining. The game is still the game still got a lot of its sort of nineties, uh, early two thousand sensibilities about it. Um, but yeah, they did a really nice addition, like a wooden box set, and I couldn't resist, and, and I picked that up. Just does it pick I, up? Yeah, it's just, just you know shiny, nice thing, uh, nice poker chips and all sorts of stuff in it. And I, I, I followed through that, and it, it followed a new, the new one, Doomtown Reloaded, followed like the Fantasy Flight LCG model. Yes, so, like, it did. Yeah, the, the, yeah like, fixed, yeah. fixed expansions. You knew what you were getting. There was no randomness. Whereas the original, much like a lot of games during the mid nineties, with, with the massive CCG glut you had at the time, were all were all collectible. And then it, and then it sort of died off again. Yeah, um, I remember somebody at the club. Um, Andy um, yeah. was playing it kind of non-stop and he was actually going as far as kind of going to <coughs> tournaments Yeah, about kind of like even like two years ago I think he was heading over to I think he might have been heading over to Edinburgh or something for kind of like uh, yeah. tournaments and then all of a sudden as quick as you know as quick he was like really really into it it kind of just disappeared and then I think um, it was almost like kind of things like Destiny kind of yeah. um kind of sure. took back over but no doubt it'll get resurrected again it's like one of well, these it's one of these strange z- z- genres that keeps kind of disappearing and then somebody says oh western cowboy game let's do that well, <laughs> uh, well it has sort of resurrected again there was a kickstarter last year pinnacle picked it up so pinnacle yeah. had the original rights to the deadlands role-playing game all ah, right okay. Uh, which is one of the first role-playing games like that was one of the first sort of proper in inverted commas role-playing games that i i ran yeah and it was a beast of a system with like poker chips and cards and all sorts of things uh and it had a resurrection as a savage world saying um which and savage worlds is basically the deadland system but all the all the sort of crap sort of taken out of it yeah yeah and really 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 streamlined down uh but pinnacle now have the rights to the the card game as well and they ran a kickstarter last year for a new expansion sort of 150 cards or something like that like a big box kind of expansion kind of thing 
Um, and I, I, I back that because I quite like Doomtown. And I think they're sort of planning to sort of keep it ticking over in the background. There's still a very fervent community for it. They really, there's a lot of people that really love that game. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm sort of collecting out of nostalgia more than anything. I don't actually get to play it that often. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think I think they're planning to sort of like once a year do like another Kickstarter for here's our next expansion and would you like to back this again that kind of thing keep it ticking over that way. Which yeah, is great use great use of the platform. Yeah, which is pretty good because you kind of want that. I think that's one of yeah. um, maybe Star Realm. One of the reasons Star Realms kind of seems to keep um, kind of mm. ticking over is because every couple of years uh, Robert kind of kind of twiddles his thumbs and then says, mm, "I'm a bit bored." I'll do another expansion or they did they just did a, a complete kind of new version of the game kind yeah. of recently for kind of star realms and i was like i'm talking about kind of like oh there's not an awful lot of western theme stuff but western legends has just been out in kickstarter yeah and, and i was talking to one of the guys who was developing it about three weeks ago so i should really try and remember i'm getting i'm getting old Ian. i'm getting <laughs> i'm getting dice brain or something yeah, I have to write all this stuff down now. I'm telling you, I have to do that as well. It's like to, it's lucky I'm speaking to you wearing like trousers. To be perfectly honest. Oh yeah, trousers. I should have put those on. Yeah. I, you know, good, sometimes, good point. as I say, I've never told anyone now, but I usually podcast naked. Wow. Well, that's not really. Dire. That's not true. Everything. Um, everything's taking a turn, really. <laughs> it's kind of like, <laughs> this escalated quickly. Um, hmm. I didn't realize it was that kind of podcast. Um, Late but, night with Richard. <laughs> exactly. Just settle back and grab your dice as we take you <laughs> on a journey. <laughs> on a journey. <laughs> let's see if you can roll a twenty. Um, and so on and so forth, and let's oh move away from the ASMR stuff. Um, but Indeed. but you weren't. You, you see, you mentioned Doomtown. I mean, is that you sound like you've kind of been like apart from obviously the the six years of not playing. It sounds like the kind of the hobby has been kind of a constant in your life since then is that is that kind of like a true thing to say yeah that that's that be fairly accurate i mean since i got back i can't i'm trying to remember when i got back into role playing properly but i picked up i picked up deadlands because it like the saying was cool and it intrigued me and yeah the system was a bit of a beast but i didn't know any better yeah um so I ran that for a while at uh, Grand Edinburgh Adventurer Society, uh, mm-hmm. GIAS, which is the University Role Playing Society, and I've basically been a GM since then. Uh, I've GM'd for like various groups over the years, like GM to GIAS, and then when I finished university, I uh, I had a regular group in my house, and I've had them, I've had almost the same regular group of players for uh, Wednesday night games at my place for. 10 years something like wow. that must be it must be close on that like a little change here and there but basically the same group of people essentially like we like include my brother-in-law and like a, like a, a bunch of close friends and i'm i've been the primary gm in that group for a long time though you... though, re- though recently a mate of mine has taken over and he's been running shadow run for a couple oh, of yeah, years, okay. for a couple of years uh, yeah. and he's he's been sort of taking over those responsibilities recently I mean, is a do you find it like do you get into like a natural rhythm as a GM? I mean, are, are you constantly thinking about ideas, or are you at the point now where you're kind of got a natural kind of uh, rhythm to the group as you as you're kind of playing, or do, you, or do you like to shake it up a bit to kind of keep people interested? There's de- there's definitely with my with the group that I'm with, there's definitely some games that appeal to them and some that don't. So I'm I'm quite into the indie RPG scene. I run a couple of groups of Blades outside of that group of Blades in the Dark, which uh-huh. is the the John Harper RPG, which is absolutely fantastic. Such a good RPG, um, basically about being thieves in a sort of um, Victorian style fantasy world, a uh, fantasy city that you can't yeah. escape uh, because there's horrible, ghosty nastiness outside it, and you're all you're criminals, like. Carrying out your carrying out your uh, carrying out your activities, but it's it, it's got some indie sensibilities to it. Um, I think it might work for my group, but the group I I run with tend to like a a, a slight more trad game, so things like D and D, Shadowrun, that yeah. kind of thing work work better because uh, they like like the experience systems and leveling up and that kind of thing. Um, I've tried out some of the sort of more indie stuff like Fate, and um, I've 
tried running Diaspora, which is the sort of hard sci-fi fate game, um, and a couple of other things. And some some of those have gone down better than others. Apocalypse World was okay. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I'd quite like to run Blades for them because I think it might all be the sort of thing I like and the sort of thing they like because it's got a, a sort of fairly solid experience system built into it and you level up your characters and your gang as you go and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's just, it's came in the game for the group and my board game collection as well is very similar. It's catered essentially for that group because yeah. they're the people I play with most. So it's a matter of when I look at a game, a new game and I'm like, should I buy this? It's like, Will I get this to the table with my group? That's an int- Well, I suppose that's an interesting. Um, it's probably a very logical and sensible <laughs> kind of way to look at it. Apart from looking at it and going, "Is it new? Is it shiny? Shall I buy it?" <laughs> Which yeah, like seems so. To the, that seems to be a lot. Oh, yeah. of the, the things. Like I've been looking at the new Dinosaur Island Kickstarter, and the the only worker placement game I have in my collection is Lords of Waterdeep. That's about as worker placementy as as my group can can take like a lot, a lot of the heavier euros just don't gel with e- either me or or my group at all I, I'm, not, I'm not a great fan of the heavier euros yeah um and but dinosaur island maybe but it's a big commitment as well it's what it's like 120 dollars buy-in for the full thing yeah is and, that with the, with the new expansions in yeah that with the expansion yeah. and I'm, I'm thinking about maybe going to the, the level that gets to the two player as well because I think it might be something I could get to the table with my wife, Kath, as well, maybe. I don't, I don't... I mean, I think if Pandasaurus run this like they ran the last one, there'll be the option to kind of jump in at a later time, a later mm. date, and kind of um, increase what, you're, what you're kind of, you were committing to. Yeah, that's true. So you've always got that kind of option as well. Yeah. Um, but they've had a... As usual, there's been a couple of the Moaning Marys going on about, you're just, you know, we were told it was a exclusive and now you're just putting it out there again and people can get the deluxe version again. It's like, well, yeah, at the time, but at the time, you know, at the time when Pandasaurus launched it, they didn't expect it to do like kind of six figures. So there's obviously been a, there's been a demand for it and as with all these things, there's been people kind of going back and going... Actually, I wouldn't have minded a slice of that, and it turns yeah. out that it's kind of sold out. You know, it's kind of sold really, really well. Um, do I want the two-player version? Um, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> I've kind of looked at it and went again. In your such like your situation, it's like, is there going to be somebody that I'm going to sit down and just play this, play this yeah. two-player? I guess with you doing the card stuff as well, it's like, well, do I play? Julesaur Island, or do I sit down with a game of Doomtown, which I know yeah. and love, and kind of know the system? So we'll see. Brian's uh, Brian Lewis is he's coming on, uh, I think next week or the week after, to right. uh, to have a chat. So I'll kind of ask him, <laughs> see yeah. what he, see what he thinks. But I, yeah, I mean, I, f- I find looking at Kickstarters and figuring out whether I want to back them or not really hard. I I back very little, mm. to to uh, in the sense that I I. Rather than like the one dollar pledge levels, which I've, I, have, I have, I have a weird question about that. Like, because I hear people saying like, you know, I back this, I back that, and then they back to like a one dollar level. It's like, is that is that really backing it? I, I don't know. Like, I I'm not in that ecosystem enough to figure out whether that there's an answer to that or not. But I haven't like I bought the game as such. I find mm. it really hard to look at a Kickstarter, especially like one that might be like a year or more down the line and is asking for like a hundred dollars plus of my money. It's like. Will that be good? Like I, I backed, I backed two rooms and a boom, off the yes. shop and sit down uh, recommendation. Yeah, because I was looking for sort of a large number player party game at the time to to sort of fill a gap in my collection, um, and that took two years to get to me. And it was like it was yeah. basically just a deck of cards, and I and because they plasticized the cards, which was the major problem they had, as far as as I understand it. Uh, the first thing I did was take it out of the box and then throw all the plastic cards over a room because they were slippy. <laughs> <laughs> Took them out of the shrink wrap, boom. I'm like, oh, okay, good. It's Excellent. like um, it's like playing. Um, was it when you play Bez? If you've ever played Bez as Yogi, and those cards are plasticized as well, but at least they can mm. got a matte finish on them. Yeah. So it's not like playing with a sleeve deck of cards where they go everywhere. I mean, they're quite <laughs> they're quite tactile and they're quite 
quite easy and quite kind of nice, yeah. kind of nice to hold. I think the dollar thing. I think, um, <clears throat> I think the dollar thing becomes more and more popular because I think there is a, there's a bigger section of the community who like to go along for the ride and like to be involved in the community mm. and yeah. see what's happening. And I think. And you've also got to remember about all the creators as well. There'll be a lot of people who will be looking at their Kickstarter campaign and thinking, I have no idea what I'm going to be doing. So the best thing to do is to maybe jump on a campaign that's working and see how it works. So I think there's kind of value There's value in that. I can understand as a creator having, um, you know, having, say, th- uh, you know, 50, $57 backers on your you know, on your pledge level when you think, well, you could actually be 57 full backers must be really, really frustrating, especially if people maybe wait until the actual pledge manager kicks in. But then the other side of it, as I say, there's there's some people who like to go along for the ride. I mean, a lot of the Kickstarter stuff, the joy of the Kickstarter is sometimes the campaign of the Kickstarter, which I don't know if you've seen that. I've seen a lot. I've seen yeah, a lot. I've seen a little the, bit. There seems to be a line, a kind of a line of grief, <laughs> almost. <laughs> that there's all this. Yes, we did it, guys. Together with me, hands joined, we can do this. Let's reach this last thing. And as soon as it finishes and it gets six months down the line, it's almost like, "Where's my game?" Yeah, kind of thing. The, 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 it, it does. Like, yeah, I totally get your point about the one dollar level, like involving people in the community. But I, yeah, there's definitely going to be a segment of that community that's then going to feel slightly entitled to your time. And your replies and that kind of thing, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, and that that brings with it its own set of problems. I mean, most the most most backers, as far as I can see, are like, yeah, whatever. There's been a delay here or this year, and as long as the communication's okay, that seems to be the key to the successful Kickstarter campaigns. If you're communicating well with your backers, there's not too many problems. But if you just stay silent for several months and then have a back, uh, have an update and stay silent for several months and have an update. And people get really narky, and I can sort of understand that they want to like know what's going on. Yeah, I think if the community's been kind of really vibrant during the campaign, mm. and then all of a sudden you do kind of go into, well, listen, guys, it's not like we're working really, really. It's not like we're not working really hard here. You know, the files are away. We're waiting for the guys to to um, print the stuff out and then kind of um, send it off to us. I can see the frustration in that. I yeah. can see people saying, "Well, you know, all you need to say is there's nothing happening." But it's like if you're, it's like, I guess as a creator, do you want to be that person that's sending out an update that says, "Guys, there's nothing to report. I'm still waiting for the final, the final stuff to happen." I guess I mean you kind of think, "Well, do I bother or just I, could, I just leave it?" And it turns out a lot of the time, you 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 normally you should have bothered kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it, it is a really tricky one because if you're not in like marketing or that kind of thing, like. The instinct would be to not bug people, but yes. But from a like a you are running a business point of view, you want to communicate to those people and say, "Here's what's going on." Is admittedly nothing right now, but just to let you know that we're still alive and breathing and doing things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's been, and I think I even saw that a couple of times from, um, you know, um, Isaac Childress when he was doing the um, the Gloomhaven stuff. Um, and when he was doing the founders of Gloomhaven, he was kind of like saying, yeah, guys, um, nothing much to report, but just to let you know, I'm kind of still kicking about and yeah. this is where we're going to be going next and, and stuff like that as well. It depends because, I mean, um, it, it's really weird because I think if you're involved in the Kickstarter community quite a lot, I think there's sometimes a tendency for you to exist in that Kickstarter bubble and look at where your next game is coming from from that Kickstarter bubble. Yeah, sure. It, it was really yeah, it was really interesting to me, like because uh, I'm I'm part of the the board game exposure group now. Oh yeah. They had yeah. they had a little they had a little poll at the end of last year, like sort of what was your favorite game from 2017? And I came to the realization that I'd played almost nothing released in 2017, <laughs> like almost, <laughs> almost nothing. Because like because a lot of them like back Kickstarters fairly frequently and like get Kickstarters through the post. Yeah. But I, I just don't. And a lot and like a lot of new games come out through Kickstarter now, so I don't get to see them as much. Like I saw some stuff at Expo and stuff like that, like things like Escape the Dark Castle, which I really advocated for because I thought it was excellent. Um and, and other sort of bits and pieces uh, um across them. But yeah, like 
they they consume a lot of the new games, and I'm getting to see some of that now because I'm I'm part of the group, which is great. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, for the most time, I'm sort of consuming games from a couple of years back. Now that now that they're out, and I can like pick them up in my hands and read reviews and and figure out whether I should add them to my collection or not. It's a it's a really interesting one that. Yeah, as I say, I think some people exist. There, are, I know some people for a fact will never ever go near a Kickstarter campaign. Mm, They'll yeah. just be like, no, I'm not, you know, I I mean, they've been either that or they're just like, well, I'm not interested because I know of, you know, you know, I know mate, my mate Steve, um, Steve back to Kickstarter and uh, the backers came to his house in the middle of the night and removed all his teeth. <laughs> and Gosh. it's like, really? <sighs> yes, apparently they were collecting enamel for the figurines. <laughs> wow. I'm never using Kickstarter. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, see, I, you kind yeah. of get that. Yeah. I've got I've got a good friend of mine who's vehemently anti Kickstarter. He, he's got very much the opinion of like, you know, come back to me when your game is actually out in retail, and I can buy it from, or I can buy it from you directly. Which like, which is a perfectly reasonable attitude. I can understand it. But then, um, like Tom, uh, I interviewed uh, Thomas Pike in the in the Meeting of Mind series I started recently, and he said something that I hadn't thought about before, which is that some Kickstarter folks want to be publishers, so they want to like put out loads of games and that kind of thing, and actually become a publisher. Cool. Some are just designers who want to put their game out into the world and be done with it. Yeah, and that's perfectly fine too. Yeah, but but um, reali- realizing that there are those two distinct kind of things was a sort of like a little bit of a revelation to me. It was like, oh yeah, that's that's not a bad point actually. Yeah, I mean, let's look. I mean, um, okay, going back to when I said about Western Legends earlier yeah. on. I mean, they've just. I mean, that's Colossal Games. They've just done a Kickstarter for Kami Sama, and they've got another one just coming for. <laughs> A sci-fi one, I can't remember. Yeah, the yeah, and uh, Western Legends designer is not the same designer as Kami Sama. They're two, no. you know, it's two different people. Yeah. So they are colossal and are using it in the same vein that say, um, Simon are using it in the same way that Steamforge yeah. have used it. You know, a lot of a lot of even some of these other businesses have used it, and um, where they're using it as a as a as a platform to maybe get a designer's game published. Because it's an excellent way of gauging the interest and also kind of managing what your potential print run could be. Sure. Um, and then on the other side of it, you do get your kind of, you know, you get your Bezes of this world, your Mark McKinnons of this world, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Justin Morgan Davis of this world, um, who are using Kickstarter because they are a designer and that is one of the ways that they, this one of the way, the few ways they can get their games made yeah. because I don't know, I mean I played um Bez's game uh, Yogi. Yeah. And um she explained it within like five minutes. But I looked at it and said I mean it did I mean it was originally in a bind. Um and she managed she's one of these people that's managed to get herself published. But I thought, well yeah, if you hadn't got a kicks if you hadn't gone to Kickstarter in the first place, would that have ended up on that journey or would it have sat down as a set of whatever how many cards you know that you you would maybe bring out at a party or something like that. So I guess yeah. there's that you know there's that kind of there's that kind of thing as well. Yeah, because um, I've I've done a little bit of publishing myself. Um, I had a game called Revenge of the Bee Movie. Yeah. In the early days of UK Games Expo, when it was still in a mason's hall in the middle of Birmingham. Oh right. Uh, okay. Which was a fantastic venue and really interesting and full of like cases of weird artifacts and pictures of like members on the wall and all sorts. Uh, but when when Games Expo first started out, I was a member of a group called the Collective Endeavor, mm-hmm. uh, which was a sort of uh, a group of small indie RPG publishers. Uh, but I wanted to put out a card game, um, and so I did s- some of the very early print on demand stuff with the, the now infamous Ken Whitman, um, and printed out like uh, just printed cards through him and sort of like. So lots of a hundred to two hundred each, rather than like the thousands or tens of thousands you need to go to China or somewhere like that. Uh, and that 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 model still exists. You can like drive through cards, um, which um, now exists alongside the drive through RPG site. You can still yeah, print yeah. Out sort of cards on demand, and there's Game Crafter and things like that. So I think I think there's a route to doing that sort of thing, like uh, rather like bypassing Kickstarter and just sort of printing some games that you have some faith in at a low cost. And just bringing yeah. out a few, like maybe a couple of hundred at most, yeah. taking them to a con and selling them, and having a having a laugh doing it that way. But yeah, Kickstarter is obviously like it gives you the marketing and all that kind of thing as well. If you have a really successful Kickstarter, then yeah, people will notice. 
Well, you've got a. I think you've got the Game Crafter. Mm, and yeah. Yeah. I mean, you had sites like that that were in America, which allowed allowed people to go ahead and kind of, I guess, create their game, upload their kind of their files and stuff like that. But again, you had to have kind of like the, the kind of the money, kind of behind yeah. that in order to be able to create the stuff kind of in the first place. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, is there anything that you? I mean, staying away from <clears throat> Kickstarter or jumping into Kickstarter. Um, is there anything that's kind of floating your boat at the moment that you you know you've mentioned you've said well dinosaur island um it's good um it's certainly worthwhile playing have you played dinosaur island i haven't but i've recently uh, i've been talking to rory of board meetings i think you've had him on as well yes yeah um and we're talking about playing some games over tabletopia uh, which yes. i haven't used for a while i used it for a couple of reviews last year with um uh with farsight and Subterra, I reviewed oh, both, Louis, of, the, yeah. I reviewed both of those by Louis playing Shaw's them. Game, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I reviewed Shaw's both game, of those yeah. by playing them with Lewis and Peter, uh, respectfully over over Tabletopia, and it was a little rough then, but it's now on Steam and it seems a lot smoother and shinier. Yeah. So um, yeah, we might play some games together over over Tabletopia, and he he might teach me like Dinosaur Island that kind of thing, and it, that seems like a really interesting way to get people to look at your games without having to fork out a lot of money. Um. And it, it's my understanding that like board game apps and that kind of thing, like the, the apps for like whatever board game is like Suburbia or whatever, tend to have a good knock on effect at retail as well. Like people buy the board game after playing the app and that kind of thing. Um, I cer- I certainly, yeah. um, it certainly, it um, certainly, it was a thing that made me love Star Realms. I yeah, mean, I-, I can't, I can't thank the Star Realms app team enough because I think it. Um, it's really it's really funny because it made me um buy get Star Realms a copy of the game Star Realms only to never play <laughs> the physical game of Star Realms because then I realized you had to be clever and figure out what your what your kind of your um your kind of your life points or your whatever you call your reputation yeah. or whatever was physically with your mind and I was like oh I can just do this <laughs> I can just do this on an app kind of instead i uh, yeah it's kind of interesting because i mean we get and you probably get this as well you start to get emails from people who are still willing to send you a physical yeah prototype absolutely. of the game and i'm just wondering is it is it easier to make a physical physical prototype of the game or is it easier to maybe set it up on something like tabletopia and get people to play it kind of that way it's kind yeah. of interesting because I would assume it would save you an awful lot more money putting it on Tabletopia than it would actually having a prototype. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't tried to design Tabletopia or like um, Tabletop Simulator or anything like that yet, but yeah. the, it's something I'm considering for playtesting in the future because I, ru- I run the, the Edinburgh playtest group uh-huh. um, and it's something I'm considering for my own designs to, to sort of rapidly prototype things and see how easy that is so it's, it's something i'm going to take a swing at soon and it's like having a look at whether how easy it is to put a game onto tabletopia i do find tabletopia slightly odd in that it's not like an app that does stuff for you it's literally just a simulation of the tabletop so it feels a little odd like it's not doing stuff for you and it's not quite good enough to be a full simulation either yeah so it's, it's somewhere in between but i'm sure that's something i can get used to yeah, it's kind of like you do need the other person on the other side to be kind of like holding your hand and leading yeah. you through, because it is basically it's um, somebody described to me as it's like cardboard sandbox. You yeah, know, totally. It is the pieces are going to be lying in front of you. You still need the rules. You'll still need somebody to know the game. It's not like an app. It's just like a kind of like a simu a simulation. Um, mm. I mean, you've you obviously. I mean, talking to you, you've you've got. A lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. So, I mean, what made you decide to kind of say, right, okay, I'm going to start kind of essentially creating content? Well, like the giant, like the giant brain has been around as a company since hmm. I don't know when. <laughs> a long time okay. ago. Like when when I said when I, when I was publishing Revenge of the Bee movie and uh, its sequel. The giant brain logo was there, and the giant brain company name was there, and that was come up with at one of the Gen Cons that I attended, talking to a bunch of people because I had this idea for a company that might put out sort of educational games and that kind of thing, and I wanted to have that that the name have that edge to it. Uh-huh. Um, but and then I sort of let let it go fallow for a while, didn't really do very much with the website or anything like that, 
and then and I was sort of like putting out the occasional article on on the blog and that kind of thing and that mm. um and then about a year ago I just decided to like go well I quite enjoy writing about games so I'll have a proper dig at this and like games expo is coming up so I applied for a press pass and shockingly enough got one um and yeah it just sort of went from there and sort of snowballed snowballed it from there into like actual content and uh, then producing like series like uh, Beyond the Veil for Arkham Horror, and um, recently with Meeting the Minds, where I'm, I'm interviewing uh, written written interviews with um, indie publishers and all sorts in the in the UK gaming scene. I've got one with uh, David Wright, who's doing Tabletop Scotland coming up. Oh, uh, good old David. Yeah, I do like yeah, him. Uh, yeah, do uh, like yeah, him. yeah, I really like David, and I'm running the the playtest um, section of Tabletop Scotland. I'm helping them run that. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll I'll be in charge of that section of Tabletop Scotland. Really, really, really looking forward to Tabletop Scotland. Like a proper, a proper con in Scotland is is going to be great. I'm proper excited for it as well. Yeah, I know it's, I know it's only half an hour away from where yeah. I live. Oh, well, my my mother in law lives nearby, so yeah, I might I might stay in Perth that night oh, because wow. there's most likely going to be drinking involved. Yes, <laughs> who knew? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And he's, uh, David's got a really good team, and he's got a really good, he's got a solid plan behind him of, of what he wants to do with it. Yep, and he's also got John as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but just, just, for old John Harper, we do love him. He's been on the show. He's magnificent. I saw him last week. He doesn't deserve the flack I did get him, but in some ways he does. Um, <laughs> and I'm not going to say anything about Dave because he could. He's taller than me. And he could probably put me into the ground quite easily. Yeah, he's, um, he's, but he's no, a big man. He is a big man. But um, yeah, no, but so you started... I mean, you've but you've been fairly kind of prolific with what you've been doing. I yes. mean, you, you're putting up regular reviews. I mean, as a content as a content creator, do you... I mean, have you just got into the mindset as I'm going to keep creating content until somebody says go and stop creating content. I mean, do you think you have to kind of have that mindset? I, th- I think so, yeah. I mean, to an extent, like, yeah, you want positive feedback, you want the community to like your stuff, um, and and you want to, like, see the followers on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram increasing at a regular rate. Uh, but in the end, like, so, like, at the start of the year, I saw, like, so last year I was putting out sort of content on a sort of semi-regular basis. I didn't really have a schedule in mind. I was yeah. just putting out stuff as it occurred. I put out quite a lot of stuff in the in the run up to UK Games Expo where I wrote about every single exhibitor. That almost broke me. I think I had fourteen articles in the end on that. Yeah, uh, there's a lot a lot of exhibitors. I'm doing something a little different this year because there's there's over three hundred this year, at least. So I'm I'm doing something a little different this year. Um, get a bigger pen. Get, get a bigger <laughs> pen and, and a can of Red Bull, and everything will be fine. Um, but yeah, um, so like at the start of the year, I decided I start to put out more regular content. So I'm putting out content on a Tuesday and a Friday. Yeah. Um, and I'm writing all sorts of stuff. So I've got, I've I've started to put series together. So I've got something a little easier to write about. So like, um, I've got Beyond the Veil, which is looking at the Arkham Horror LCG, which is a game I absolutely love, and it's going breaking down the mechanical, um, sort of. Because each scenario is different, and each scenario is trying to tell a little story, so it's looking at how the mechanics support the story and that kind of thing, and sort of breaking it down. It's spoiler heavy, so don't go there if you haven't. E- each one has the title of the scenario. Don't read on if you haven't. Um, if, you, if, you have, if you haven't played that scenario, but yeah, they're sort of like talking about how how clever the design team are. Because I think I think the design team are are spot on for that game. I've started Gloomhaven Diaries recently because um, I picked up Gloomhaven, and that that game has blown me away. If, if that, that's funny. If, if that isn't my game of the year, I'll be very, very surprised. I spoke to well, what? Yeah, so I was chatting to Luke Hector from the Broken Meeple. Sure. And he was talking about Gloomhaven, and he he thinks it's average. Really? <laughs> which is, yeah. Which is um, fair enough. I mean, I I think like we were talking about Kickstarter earlier. I think Gloomhaven is the perfect example of a Kickstarter game. There is there are very few publishers you could go to that game and go, yeah, I'd like to produce a box that's about 140 pounds and is essentially just a world in a box, and has all this <laughs> stuff in it. It's like, uh, get out. Exactly. I've actually made them, and do you get you've you've done miniatures. Well, why is everything in white cardboard boxes? 
Because it's secret. Secret things. That's I the thing. Like, wait, sh- I can't show you. What's yeah. in it? Show me the code. I can't show you secret things. It, yeah, that Isaac Child. He's such a troll. Like when, because I, I was, I, I'd started to organize that. I did a, I did a post about sort of organizing the box because that it's a beast of a thing that. And then a couple of people I'm playing it with are nice enough to buy me the basically wooden organizer for it, which is also known as Kallax shelving. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. it just fits in the box. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and so I, I was putting that together and I took out the tray and found the, the hidden envelope below the tray, which oh, just says really? on it, open this when you feel you deserve it. <laughs> That's just such a troll. Because every, every session, after every session we play, we like pick it out and go, do we deserve this yet? And we're like, oh, maybe? I don't know. Oh my What's goodness. in there? It's a, That'll be it's fantastic. A, yeah, it's, um, yeah we, we've been... We've been playing. We were four sessions in now. And I've just put up the the third part of the Gloomhaven Diaries, which is called the the Journey of Larimar, which is my Cragheart. So it's more narrative and from his point of view of what's going on in the world, and that's sort of how I'm going to continue. So every three or four sessions we get in, I'll write up another one of those uh, from about the story from his point of view. I think we might be the bad guys. It's possible. It's possible we're the bad guys. Oh my goodness, that reminds it, me. That's that sketch, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Do you think oh, we're the bad? That, that's a think, brilliant I think, sketch. I don't know. I've just been looking around at the uniforms and the way we march, yeah. and yeah. how we're perceived by the public, and I think we're the bad guys. Have you seen our uniforms? They've got <laughs> little skulls on them. <laughs> yeah, that's, oh, that's I love that fantastic. sketch. It's fantastic. fantastic. But yeah, we're, we're, it's turned out that we're basically the bad guys, which I love. I love that that is emerging as a story from that game. I really, really love board games where you get an emergent story that is that is interesting and something you don't expect and surprising. That that to me is a perfect, perfect board game. It's kind of why I like the Arkham Horror LCG so much because you get little moments of story emerging from that. So yeah, I've, I've got those two. I've got Beyond the Veil. I've got the Gloomhaven Diaries, and I've starred recently Meeting of Minds. Uh, which is interviewing people from across the UK gaming industry, yeah. publishers, yeah. designers, that kind of thing. And yeah, I've got so I've got uh, yeah, I've got like I say I've got David Wright lined up. I've got um, Kevin Young from oh, uh, Legends Untold uh, lined up, and who else I've got lined up? I've sent one off to uh, Matt from Steamforge Games. Uh, who uh, a friend of mine put me in touch with? Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So I, I've been asking him him a few things. Um, who else I've got lined up? Bad Cat Games. Justin. Yeah, Justin awesome. Bad Cat Games. Who I need to get. I'm going to hopefully get that and a review of Gladiatores in in the run up to their Kickstarter. Uh, I've got one to Wrench Games, uh, Blind Wizard Brawl, which I backed. Yeah, we don't yeah. speak about them. Oh, uh, we don't speak because they are wizards. <laughs> they definitely are wizards. Yeah, just, that, you know, they came fair. on the show and that's what they said. So, no, we don't even talk about them. In fact, we cut them out of any episode that they're mentioned in. Well, just every just for you, I'll, single. Time. Just for you, I'll, ca- I'll cancel that questionnaire. I mean, they can fill it out, but I'll never, I'll never see the light of day. Well, yeah, just you know, if you um, obviously get the questionnaire back, print it out, and then send them a video of you setting it on fire and laughing maniacally at them, or in fact, send the questionnaire to me. <laughs> and I can film a video of me laughing maniacally at their questionnaire and I'm just, you know, going through it with a red pen and going, wrong, wrong, <laughs> wrong, Absolutely. wrong, you get an F, you failed the exam, this is me burning your precious little wizardy questionnaire. Not that I'm a bit obsessed about it, I'm going to step away because my vein at the side of my head has started to, started to twitch. I mean... As a okay, as a as a content nonsense aside, as a content creator, um, <clears throat> are you writing for the enjoyment of it, or do you are you conscious about writing to get people to get their eyes on it? I'm conscious of trying to produce good reviews that people will find interesting to read. Right. So, like, not like I don't want to produce like really short reviews that are like back of the cereal box kind of stuff. Like, because mm. what's the point in that? I want to like say this is what I think of this game for these reasons, and I want to dive into it a little bit more. So, like generally, like like word count wise, I'm trying to hit around the thousand to two thousand word mark on most reviews to like to actually have some time to delve into it and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not, although you're conscious of like having the following and like getting 
Facebook likes or whatever and that kind of thing. I'm just trying to produce good stuff best I can. Most most of the time, just trying to write well. Um, and like, um, I think I, I had a turning point sort of last year in my writing. Uh, initially, my review writing was fairly stiff. Um, I'd have to I'd have to say like so it's pretty dry. Uh, and then the Tabletop Cafe in Edinburgh closed down, and I wrote an article that you can find on my site called Tabletop Cafe The End. Yeah, that, that was very personal. I sort of poured my heart into it and said, like, this place was great, and it's a real shame it's died, and here's why these places are fantastic for the communities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that has a little turning point in my writing style, and I started to, like, pour a bit more of myself into reviews and, and just have a go at, like, putting my personality in reviews a bit more. And I think that started to get me a bit more traction um, with reviewers and uh, and occasional company getting in touch and being nice enough to give me a copy of the game and that kind of thing. I still don't get a lot of that. I get a bit of it through the, the board game exposure group, obviously. Um, but yeah, I still get occasional people contacting me and um, like sending me a game or two to review, which is nice. And I'm, I'm trying, one of my projects for the year is to try and get through my collection uh, for reviews. So that's... Not going well so far, <laughs> but I'll get there in the end. But yeah, ho- hopefully uh, by by the end of the year, maybe sort of early into next, I'll have every game in my collection will have a review attached to it, and I'll have a rating for it on Board Game Geek and that kind of thing as well. Are you finding you're kind of settling into a steady pace then? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I, like I sometimes fall behind a little bit. So like after we're finished up tonight, I'll be I'll be finishing off my article for tomorrow. Um, mm. uh, but like I've got, I've got this weekend off, so I'll probably sort of bash out a couple more articles for next week, and that'll put me ahead a little bit of the game. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm I'm enjoying I'm enjoying just sitting down and writing and like thinking about a game and like just mm. pouring pouring out some words onto onto the screen. Um, tend tend to sort of like take a first draft, which is just like consciousness onto a page, and then then have an edit of it. Um, but yeah, no, I'm I'm really enjoying it, and like I haven't felt haven't felt any burnout as such yet uh, i've always got stuff to write about all this stuff at the back of my mind to to put down on paper so yeah no it's been good i think if you enjoy it i think that's half the battle yeah I think that's it yeah. i think it, i think i get to the point where i'm just like you know <coughs> oh, i can't be bothered yeah. i think that's when you kind of you need to step away because i think it turns into almost like a job job yeah if you're producing it i guess it depends it, it depends on because we <laughs> while we're pro- prolific with their content were hardly very timely. I mean, it's not like you can wake up on a Monday morning at 8 o'clock and there'll be an episode there. You can wake up on a Monday, a Wednesday, a Tuesday afternoon, a Saturday morning, and there'll be various episodes there. But that's down to timing, it's down to Kickstarters, it's course, down to yeah. when people want to speak to you. You know, that's just yeah. one of these... It's just kind of one of these one of these things. Um, I mean, if you looked into things like videos and stuff, is that something that you would consider doing or are you quite happy kind of staying with the the kind of the writing side of things at the moment? I tried a little bit of video stuff. I can't remember when it was. I think it was when I got Tiny Epic Western through Kickstarter. I did a wee unboxing video just out of sheer curiosity to see if I could do something. Yeah. And it was okay, but I, I can't be bothered. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there's a lot of effort. I have all, I have massive respect for people like shop and sit down and no pun included and people like that that really put out fantastic videos, really yeah. good content and and take the time to do it. But I don't have the time, inclination, or skills to do that. Uh, I'm looking into podcasting right now and I'm starting something up with a couple of friends. Um, but I like from like the core of the giant brain will always be the written word. I think, and I re- I really like. I really like writing that stuff, so yeah, I think that will be always be the core of it. I think it's because you can rework writing as well. Mm, yeah, yeah, you can always I go think back. If, yeah. yeah, you can go back and kind of play around with it. I think um, you need to... It's like, when we're chatting just now, there's certain things I'll probably listen back to in six months and go, what are you saying that for? You're saying like, you know, mm. stupid. But then you just have to kind of let it go at the time. I yeah. think the the trouble is I've done or I will do and I have been doing kind of written stuff and my written stuff takes longer than my podcast stuff because my written stuff I'm really overly critical of myself. I mean yeah. I'll write I'll write something and then I'll rewrite entire paragraphs three or four times over and then I'll write I'll then I'll realize it's changed the entire tone of the piece and then I'll rewrite the whole thing and then I'll <laughs> run away and cry about it but 
So the fact that you're so 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 prolific is kind of really quite kind of really quite kind of cool. You. Um, you dropped that horrible word podcast in there, yeah. which screams at me that at the moment we're doing okay for competition because the, you know, as I say, there's only us and the un- unlucky frog gaming people that I have to worry about, and they're doing some really really good stuff. So I'm running yeah. scared of them. They um, are. Yep. <laughs> What kind of stuff? Why am I talking to you, to? really? Yeah, just. I know. <laughs> I know. It's okay. Finish it. <laughs> and that was Ian McAllister. Unfortunately, the rest of the episode got cut off. <laughs> I swear, if you edit this, then that's the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly. I'll be just. Boo. Ian. Ian. We've lost See, I could do this because I could just change. This is this is my side of the track. Absolutely. So I, could, so I don't have to cut this. I can silence this bit of you talking. <laughs> Just go, Ian. Are you there, Ian? Ian? Oh, he's gone. Oh, oh what, what a shame. <laughs> That's a sh- no. Um, I mean, is it... I mean, a podcast is completely different. I mean, you you got kind of ideas with what you're doing for the podcast. Are you? Is it a big surprise? Is it a big, big secret? No, uh, no, I've, I've I've been showing off like a couple of the bits of equipment and that kind of thing on Instagram. Um, and yeah. I've been mentioning it a little bit. Um, essentially, we're uh, it's myself and Jamie and Sam from the Meeples People's podcast. Yes. Um, and we're sort of a- we're aiming for the first one to be out towards the end of March. Uh, it's tentatively entitled Brainwaves to tie in with the giant brain because you know marketing and pr and all that um that's genius um and it's going to be a sort of magazine style news show kind of thing so um i think like board game reviews via the day-to-day and brass eye that's kind of what we're that's kind of what we've got in our heads whether it turns out like that is another matter altogether but that's sort of the idea we have in our heads of, of what's going to come out. So there'll be like a new segment at the start with us sort of pretending to be CNN sort of news anchors, that kind of thing. And segments. So we've got like a, um, for the first one, we've got plans for a fog of love review done in the style of a Jeremy Kyle show. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, a photosynthesis review done in the style of David Attenborough. And, oh. <laughs> and, uh, I'm writing at the moment, I haven't recorded it yet, a segment about collection weight, but written like a sort of like self-help, do you want to lose weight kind of... Oh my goodness. One of, the, one of those terrible adverts you see on TV, uh, measure, measuring your collection in, in, calyx, in uh, games per calyx unit. <laughs> Other shelving units are available. Other shelving units are available, of available. course. Terms and conditions available on request. Yeah. So, like, whether, how how we keep up the pace of that out, kind of output or that kind of thing, I don't know, but we'll we'll see. It's it's been a laugh so far. We've had a couple of practice sessions just doing the new stuff and sort of like riffing off each other. Um, Do you yeah. just go for it? Do you just select yeah. the topic and go for it? I mean, you can't script. I mean, I know I was uh, when we were uh, creaking shelves. Hmm. Seemed to do a lot of kind of scripted stuff, and I was like, I don't know. I don't know if I could do that. Yeah, at, at the moment, so our plan is like so. At the moment, what we have, like what we did, uh, we actually just did this a couple of days ago. We we just we grabbed some news headlines. Um, we've got a sort of intro already with the three of us doing a doing a sort of like sort of news show style intro, uh, and then like I'm reading out a few headlines, and then we go between us talking about those various headlines, having a bit of a chat. Um, there's a there is plans for a regular weather section, as in whether or not you should back a Kickstarter. Boom, tish. Hey. <laughs> We're here all week. Tip your waitress. Um, and yeah, so uh, like the idea is that we can do the news segment fairly riffy off of each other. It'll be about sort of 10-15 minutes. Uh, we can do the segment e stuff, like this more scripted side of things, a little separately or together as we need it. And then we can sort of shove it all together. Plan is for the, like each each cast to be about thirty to forty five minutes at most, like fairly, so fairly short, fairly zippy. Mm. Uh, keep keep the pace up, um, and yeah, hopefully, hopefully initially our plan is every couple of weeks. Um, if we can get it faster than that weekly, we will. But it, because we're doing that's some- a lot of work. Yeah, weekly. exactly. Doing doing something that's got like that scripted element to it weekly might 
might break us weekly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, every couple of weeks is the plan at the moment. Uh, that, that'll give us some time to produce uh, produce content in between. But yeah, it's, it's yeah. been a laugh so far, and we, and we riff off each other nicely. So yeah, That's hopefully cool. end, end of the month, hopefully see the first one of that coming out. You have to do like um, a watch it played kind of thing, and just descri- and just have you playing a game live on air, but not actually show any pictures at all. I've got a vague plan, so I have been slowly introducing my uh, the I work for Eastside Bikes in Edinburgh, and I've had the guys round for a board game night board game night already. Yeah, I've got a vague plan to record a cast where I teach utter newbies a game. Oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah. So I've got a now. Now I've got this nice mic. I've got a vague plan to make that a reality at some point in the not too distant future. But that would be fantastic. Yeah. But, so like you know, board games with newbies, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I just have one of them turning halfway around and going, "Do you know? I, I hate this. I don't it's take awful. offense, say, but this is rubbish." <laughs> yeah, no, no, which would be fair. I, I mean, that, that's that's like one of my greatest joys is teaching new people a game and seeing like them get it and then like sort of click into it so the first the first time i had them around uh, it was on like a wednesday night when my regular group couldn't meet and like we had a curry and and i taught them lords of vegas and that that, that went pretty well that's a pretty yeah that's that's cool yeah but there's a little bit of gamble i suppose there's a kind of the gambling themey element thing so you can go there you go yeah L- lords of so vegas is means- yeah it's one of my go-to gateway games i think it's fantastic i love lords of vegas but then again, I was playing. I did play. We did play Dinosaur Island recently, and one of the guys just bounced off it within about ten minutes. Yeah, <laughs> just went. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't like it. I don't like the colors. Yeah, it's a, it's I, a, yeah, it's a really interesting one. That like yeah, like I, I'm I'm very much an advocate of the thought that there is a game out there for everyone. So I I I, I looked forever for a game for my mum, who doesn't really like board games that much, but I eventually found. Oh, the Ragnar Brothers gardening game. Blooming... I've totally forgotten what the name of it is. Blooming something or other? I've totally forgotten what it is. Let's quick. Wait, no, no, quick. Quick, to the Google. To the, to the Google cave. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> quick, go quick. Right, okay. We're, we're, fre- Brothers, we're professionals, honest. Blah, 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 blah. Blooming Gardens, were, I think it's called. They were on. Oh, my goodness, this is terrible. Right, okay. Yeah, I, th- I think it's Ragnar Brothers. I think it's called Blooming Gardens. Here we go. Blooming Gardens seems to ring a bell in my brain. And you join us tonight as we are frantically yeah, searching. Blo- Blooming Gardens is what it's called. Yeah. Blooming Gardens, there you go. Who does it? Um, according to the Board Game Geek, it is definitely our company. Yes, Ragnar <laughs> Brothers. I was correct. Yes. Yay! Because that could have been awfully bad if they turned around and says, actually, I think you'll find that the, the answer to your question is Herbaceous by Edo Baraf. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, so like she's very much into her gardening and she really likes blooming gardens. So, yeah, there's, right, a, okay. there's, a, there's a board game out there for everyone, as far as I'm concerned. There is a board game out there for everyone. Absolutely. That is, fan. That is fantastic. So, um, slightly busy then, Mr. McAllister, to be honest. Yeah, a little Very bit. Very slightly busy, just a little bit. Plenty, plenty coming up. Plenty yeah. to see. Plenty to hear. It sounds like. Yeah, hopefully. Think, <laughs> oh, definitely. Um, thank you for coming on. It's been a pleasure. I'm very conscious of the, always conscious of the time. Um, That's right. If if people have listened along tonight, and they want to um, go and find your wares on the internet internet webs where can we find you where okay. do you exist so the main website is giantbrain.co.uk um, I am on twitter as uh, at the giant brain I am on instagram as giant brain uk mm-hmm. and I am also on facebook as the giant brain I think that's everything easy as that really yeah uh, I, pu- uh, I post some of the reviews up on uh, BGG as well uh, I'm starting to do that a little bit more recently so if and as a content creator the best thing you can do to support me is basically like stuff and share it and that kind of thing uh, if anyone likes the content a lot and fancies chucking me a buck I am on Patreon and I've got a coffee account as well both of those can be got to through the website as well 
Because co- is Kofi is that C is K O dash F I dot K O F I. I'd prefer it to be called like I don't know Beery or something like that. Because let's face it, I'm probably just going to buy a pint with that money anyway. <laughs> and you've got the Patreon, yeah. as well that yeah. you're running too. Yeah, yeah. I, I started Patreon last year just out of sheer curiosity, and uh, yourselves and the lucky Fog have been good enough to chuck me a buck or two. Um, yeah, I might get enough to like buy me a pint at Games Expo, which I'll call a win. <laughs> By the time Expo comes around, it will need to be some size of Patreon because those I don't think those pipes are that. Um, They're not that cheap. No, they are not that cheap out of the Hilton. That's for certain. So, just a big call. If you fancy buying Ian a pint, please go onto his Patreon (laughs) and support him. Yeah, because writers exist on beer. He definitely deserves a beer after all the wonderful content that you put out there, without a shadow of a doubt. Um. No, again, you know, thank you very much for coming on. If you want to keep an eye on what we're up to, there's several places that we exist on the internet webs. You can go to Twitter, you can find us on We're Not Wizards. You can go to Facebook, you'll find us on We're Not Wizards. You can go to Instagram and find us on We're Not Wizards. You can go to YouTube and you can search for We're Not Wizards Tabletop Podcast and you'll find us there because our lovely podcast host, Podbean, posts all of our content up to youtube it's fantastic um you can find us on spotify apparently we're on spotify yeah well done on that (laughs) i have no idea how that happened Uh, still in shock um thinking about putting the spotify logo on the site (laughs) not sure not sure how to do it um but you can also see us on things like is it overcast and (laughs) there's a thing called overcast there's player fm there's speaker there's stitcher there's acast there's Podknife, and there's also our website, we're not wizards.com. Um, if you like the show, then please like or rate or review on your podcast catcher of your choice. If you like us very much, please go to Apple Podcasts and consider dropping us a subscription there. If you like us even more, consider dropping us a rating or a review because that kind of really gets us noticed, which is very, very kind of you indeed. Um, if you are going to give us a rating or review, remember, I beg of you, do not give us 10 stars. Because I'm naturally a little bit confident, but seeing 10 stars, just I just go about like, I'm just uncontrollable. But on the same time, I'm obviously quite shallow and fragile. So if you give us one star, that will make me cry. So give us something in the middle, like a five, because it's average. And we are decidedly average. But the person who's not been average tonight is a rather wonderful, rather fantastic, him with a cerebellum you can all be proud of. <laughs> <laughs> it's Mr. Ian McAllister from The Giant Brain. So again, thank you very, very much for coming on. Thank you for having there, me. There are only two more things to do. The first thing is to remember that we are many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Ian? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Brilliant. And the second thing is to say goodbye. So it's a goodbye from Ian. Goodbye, Ian. goodbye Ian. Every single time. Every single time. You people. Every single time. It's like you talk to each other. You really need to two Ronnies it. And it's goodbye from me. I, I, I does, and it's a goodbye from, from, from him. him. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a goodbye from him. So remember, stay safe. Roll sixes. Um, check out the giant brain. And as Ian says, if you like somebody's content, give them a little nudge. Tell them you like it on Twitter. You know, give them a thumbs up on Facebook. You know, say you like them on YouTube. You know, just um, because there is nothing more delightful than somebody actually telling you that they think that you, they think that you're, um, you know, they like your stuff. It's, it just, I don't know. Ian will tell you. It just makes your little cup of joy overflow, doesn't it? Absolutely. It's fantastic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, until the next time, though, goodbye. Goodbye.